Hi guys, welcome back to an introduction to web typography, a Touch Plus premium course. My name is Ian Yates and in this video we're going to look at the anatomy of typography. Let's quickly run down what we're going to cover in this video. Well, first off, we're going to cover some terminology where the anatomy of type is concerned. Then we're going to look at controlling some of these aspects with CSS. We'll talk about the effects altering these aspects can have on your design. And then we'll round off with some further reading. So let's begin with some measurements. As you can see from this handy diagram, we have the word typography displayed in Georgia, which is a default system font and available on most computers. It serves our example well, as it includes most of the anatomical bits and bobs we want to look at. I'm not going to go into the glossary term for every aspect of type here, just the fundamentals which you need to be aware of. Firstly, you'll see we have the baseline. There it is, glowing pink. This is the line upon which all glyphs, or characters, sit. Any character with a descender, such as a P or a Y, will sit on the baseline with the descender, that droopy bit, hanging down below. You'll also notice that curved letters, such as the P, tend to extend just below the baseline for aesthetic reasons. Next, we have what's known as the X height, which is the measurement between the baseline and the top of small lowercase letters such as, well, X. That's the reasoning behind the name. Character, characters with ascenders, such as the letter H, rise out above the X height. Again, you'll notice where a character is rounded at the top, its shoulder sticks out above the X height. Then we have the cap line, which marks the height of the uppercase letters, but not necessarily the uppermost reaches of the font, that prize goes to the ascent line, which marks the furthest possible distance between the baseline and the top of the glyphs. Conversely, there's also the descent line, which serves an equal purpose at the bottom. The distance between these two is most similar to what we recognize as CSS as the line height. Let's quickly have a look at how we can alter the line height in an HTML document using CSS. Here we have a simple HTML document which you'll find in the source files accompanying the video. Uh, it has a heading and some paragraphs. Again we're using Georgia because it's available on most systems. You'll notice the heading has a background and that's just going to serve to illustrate the line height changing as I alter the value. Now let's just open it up in a code editor. I'm using Coda but that's entirely up to you to use whichever code editor you're most comfortable with. And here in the HTML, you'll notice uh, in our body, we have the heading and a couple of paragraphs. And then within our head itself, we have the style tags. And within the style tags, we're going to be editing the CSS. Now, by default, any given textual element within CSS has a line height equal to its font size. Therefore, by giving our heading a font size of 48 pixels, we've also therefore giving it, giving it a line height of 48 pixels. Now I can alter that to give it more spacing quite simply like so. I use the line height rule and I define whatever line height I deem necessary. So I'll save that, refresh the page like so and you'll see the line height has increased significantly. This is more clearly illustrated with paragraphs. Uh, here we have a font size of 16 which is excellent for reading and the default size set in most browsers. You can see at 16 pixels line height, however, legibility isn't great. So let's improve that by bumping the line height up to 24 pixels. Just as we did with the heading, we go to our P element and we add a line height rule and make it 24 pixels. Save, refresh, and you'll see that's greatly improved. Now it's fairly standard to use a value one and a half times the size of the font size. We'll talk more on relative measurements and the baseline in a later video. As a good rule of thumb, you should always make sure the leading or line height is greater than the horizontal spacing between the words or the tracking. This directs the reader's eye along the text rather than jumping the gap and allowing them to read downwards across the lines. If I just exaggerate the line spacing here, you'll, the line height, sorry, you'll see what I mean. Uh, 
you'll see here the eye is directed very clearly horizontally rather than vertically down the body of the, the body copy. I'll just remove that and make that back to 24 as it was. So. Another measurement worth talking about is the measure itself. Yes, you understood that correctly. The measure is the width of a body of text. This is our measure here. Uh, now this is something which should be taken into account as it can seriously influence the readability of content. The copy in our example document is set at 90% of the browser's width, which you can see here. Uh, and you'll see that we have huge lengths of text. Now these are uncomfortable for reading because we have to move our heads left and right or strain our eyes. Now that probably sounds lazy, but it's a fact. We're more comfortable reading narrower bodies of text. So let's change that. Let's just alter the width to something more manageable like 450 pixels. There we go. Now a good basis to work from is that a line of text should be around two to three alphabets long or 52 to 78 characters and that includes spaces. Our measure was too long so we needed to either split it into columns or shrink the wrapper as we have done. 66 characters is considered ideal but if you're working with multiple columns this should be reduced slightly. Let's now look at some more anatomy. We've covered quite a few measurements and we now have a better understanding of how altering those measurements affects the readability of our body copy. So let's now consider a small element which divides fonts right down the middle into one of two types, the serif. Serifs are the small finishing strokes on the end of a character. Sans serif fonts, sans meaning without in French, such as Helvetica, do not have them. There are all kinds of reasons for choosing a serif font over a sans serif font and vice versa. Some would argue that serifs make a font more readable as they guide the eye between letters. Others would say that sans serif fonts are actually more readable because they're less cluttered, which is why children's books often use sans serif. Serifs are certainly decorative, but that means that small font sizes they can look confusing. Anyway, these are decisions you'll have to make for yourself. We have just a couple of things left to talk about regarding anatomy, one of which is kerning. Kerns are the overlaps experienced when certain characters encroach on another character's space. In print, when a default kerning isn't quite what you're looking for, this is dealt with by typesetting each individual character and altering its kerning to create a balanced feel between letters. Take a look at the example. Notice the way that with default kerning, the top of the F encroaches on the dot of the I. Greater letter spacing would help, but with CSS it would be applied equally across all the letters, and it's inadvisable to alter a lowercase letter spacing with CSS anyway. The alternative is to use ligatures, but that's the last glossary term I'll be throwing at you for now. Ligatures are specially designed combinations of certain letters which ordinarily don't sit well next to each other. Take our FI combination for example. Here's the ligature version. This is all well and good for print, but to use this on the web you'd currently need to use the Unicode character, in this case this, which is impractical when dealing with large amounts of text. There is development in CSS3 which will allow you to turn ligatures on or off if you wish, so bear that in mind for the future. Let's just take a look at the effect that Unicode character can have on our, our current uh, HTML example. Let's open it back up in Coda. Here we are. And on our heading here, you'll find that we do have neatly within our definite typography heading, that's the only word I could think of with an FI, uh, there's our FI, let's, uh, let's replace that now with the Unicode character. So we'll save that, bring it back in Chrome, and keep an eye on it, refresh the page, and there you'll notice the ligature making the whole legibility of that particular uh, heading much neater. Now it's good to practice kerning and I'll be giving you a useful link to do just that later on, but the reality of web typography is that we don't have much control over letters on an individual basis. The flexible nature of the web, different browsers, different resolutions, different user settings, 
and the fact that typographic tools for the web are still very young means that the screen is a very different place to the desktop. OK, it's time for some further reading. This time I'd like you to look at a few Wikipedia entries. Firstly, a definition of serif and sans serif fonts. There's also a useful reference on ligatures, which goes into more detail on what I was talking about and provides all the Unicode values you'll need to recreate ligatures in the browser. Then go and check out Kern Me if you have five or ten minutes to spare. It's a game which allows you to alter the kerning of several example words. Do so as correctly as you can and see how your efforts compare to those of a professional typesetter. Lastly, Typography Deconstructed is an online reference with every possible glossary term you could ever need to know about letter forms and typography. Now a little assignment, uh, I'd like you to play with the HTML source file uh, provided with this video. Uh, change the CSS as I was doing earlier in the example uh, and see how you can influence the legibility of the copy. Next time on an introduction to web typography, we're going to look at the technicalities of using fonts on the web. My name's Ian Yates, and from all of us here at Tuts Plus, thanks for watching.